Some people say that people of faith believe in fairy tales. The new atheists proclaim that Christians believe in God and heaven, and those beliefs amount to nothing more than wishful thinking. In the eyes of the skeptic and scoffer, to believe that there is a God who is creator of the world, it is tantamount to believing in unicorns or as they have posited, a flying spaghetti monster. The question for us tonight is, are these charges true? Is faith in a creator God like believing in a fairy tale? Many have grown up in the church, and they have been taught the Bible. They've been taught what the Bible says about the origin of the world and the beginning of the ages on faith and And that's what we were taught that the Bible says. We were taught, many of us who grew up in the church, the the things of the Word of God. However, many Christians have not revisited these foundational teachings of the Bible to look at them through the eyes of an adult and more serious study. Dinesh D'Souza, the author of the great book, What's So Great About Christianity, contends that many Christians have what he calls A crayon Christianity. Here's a picture of of Dinesh. Maybe you are familiar with him. Dinesh had this to say about his own experience of faith. I was raised Catholic in Bombay, India. The Portuguese missionaries came to India starting in the 16th century. Somewhere along the line, they seemed to have located one of my ancestors and brought him to Christianity, possibly by whopping him over the head. It was the age of the Portuguese Inquisition. Hey, I'm glad it happened, although I'm not sure my hapless ancestor would agree. Even so, I sometimes say I was raised with crayon Christianity. This is a simplified Christianity. And to many of us, we learn this from our parents and never outgrow it. We never develop a mature Christianity that can withstand the assaults of secular culture. I married an evangelical Christian in 1992, and after our daughter was born in 1995, we started attending a non-denominational church in the Washington, D.C. area. But my faith remained lukewarm, wounded, you might say, by the influences of secular culture. Only when we moved to California did we start attending a Calvary Chapel church. And I found people who took their Christianity very seriously whose faith shaped their whole life. This also began to happen to me. Basically, I went from being a crayon Christian and a lukewarm Christian to being a mature and passionate Christian. I think the journey for most people needs to be like this. You have that picture, perhaps, of some of the things in the Bible, and they're more like a child's crayon picture, something that would maybe be akin to this. You, you know the basic outlines of them, of the stories. You know the basic premises of the stories. But you haven't really kind of come back to it with fresh eyes, with an adult perspective, with that attention to some of the details that will bring a stronger foundation to the belief, the faith that you have in Christ. As you grow, your understanding needs to mature and grow. So you need to avail yourself to a deeper and vigorous picture of the faith. It's not that the crayon picture isn't true. It's that there's more to the story. And you need that clarity. You need to go from the crayon picture, I believe, to a 4K picture. Amen? To a 4K picture. You know, there's a big difference. There's a big difference in that crayon picture and a 4K resolution. Amen? Amen. So we come to the book of Genesis, the beginning of it all. As we go through the history Genesis reveals, we'll become more crisp. And my prayer is that faith will rise in your heart and that a foundation will be laid solid. Genesis is really, in that sense, a foundation of everything for faith in God and belief in Jesus Christ. 
in Genesis, the foundation is laid and the seeds are planted for everything that comes from God, including his plan of redemption and salvation. Tonight, we're going to look at the very first book of the Bible, the very first verse of the Bible. This verse is important because it single-handedly lays down the foundation of faith. Tonight, as we look at this verse of the Bible, we're really going to look at two points that are asserted. God exists, and he created the universe. Amen? God exists, and he created the universe. So let's dive into our study and look tonight at the foundation of faith. Let's begin tonight by just reading that verse, and perhaps most of you could quote it. These famous words of Genesis 1.1. It says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's been said that if you can believe this verse, that there's really no trouble in believing the rest of the book. Amen? If you can, re- you can believe this verse, there's really no difficulty in believing anything else that follows as we work our way through the Bible. The question really is, is this true? Is that true? Can it be believed? Maybe we start with this question, who wrote this? Who wrote it? Well, we believe that the Apostle Paul told us about the scriptures that all scripture is God breathed. But as Peter told us also that Men, holy men, were moved upon by the Holy Spirit, and they wrote the things down. They wrote the scriptures as they were led by the Spirit of God. And so we come to really the question of the authorship of Genesis and really of the first books of the Bible. There is a a theory about the authorship of the Bible. I'm going to throw this out uh, just for a second here because I think it's important. You need to maybe hear about this type of stuff. This is a hypothesis. It's called the JEDP hypothesis of the authorship of of Genesis and really the Pentateuch. What is it? The JEDP theory states that the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, were not written entirely by Moses, who died in the 1400s BC, but also by different authors, compilers after Moses. The theory is based on the fact that different names for God are used in different portions of the Pentateuch and that there are detectable differences in linguistic style. The letters of J-E-D-P theory stand for these four supposed authors. The J for the Yahwist, the E for the Elohist, the D for the Deuteronomist, and the P for the priestly source. The, the priestly authors of Leviticus. So that is a hypothesis, and there's really um, much that has been written over the years, although it's really not that old of a hypothesis. Uh, in fact, it's only been around for just over 200 years, maybe 250 years or so. For most of history, it has been believed that the author of Genesis and the Pentateuch is none other than Moses, right? And this is what you probably have come to understand. The consensus, I believe, is really that the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, the man who led the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. Moses himself was both the writer and editor of the Pentateuch, and these five books were composed by him in and around 1400 B.C., Moses was an eyewitness of, to most of the events of the Pentateuch, starting at about Exodus chapter 3. And he was given the history before that, I believe, by the Lord himself, because he met with the Lord many, many times. Face to face, by the way. As a friend meets with a friend, yeah, that's how... Moses met with God. So I believe that God delivered to him the history, the history of the world before his own history. 
So Moses was an eyewitness. The Pentateuch in many places uh, claims Moses' authorship. And Jesus himself references to his authorship of the Pentateuch or the Torah. Pick it up in John chapter 5. You'll see it on the screen beginning at verse 46. It says this, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Believing the writings, the words of Moses would then lead us to believing upon Christ. Amen? So what a powerful testimony of our own Lord Jesus Christ. It's a powerful statement, I believe, that Jesus makes concerning our series here in Genesis. The foundation of everything. And tonight, study the foundation of faith. By believing the words of Moses, that we would come to believe him. Wow. What a powerful, powerful thought. This verse, Genesis 1.1, it says that God created the heavens and the earth. And so then you have to come to this question, well, who is God? Who is God? What is this talking about? Well, when you do any biblical study, it's important, it's, good, it's a good idea to take a look at the original language of the text. And so when you dive in to these words here in Genesis 1 verse 1, you look at the Hebrew language, you look at Hebrew because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew um, except for a couple places, uh, that a few chapters in the book of Daniel that were written in Aramaic. And that's an interesting thing, but we won't get into that tonight. But Hebrew, Hebrew is the language of the Old Testament. And the word that we have here for the English God is the word in the Hebrew, it's the word Elohim, Elohim. Elohim is a word in the Bible that has different meanings. And those meanings are determined by the context of their usage. Elohim can mean God, the one that we know in the Bible as Yahweh, and we will come to that name as we continue through Genesis. So Elohim can mean God. It can mean Yahweh God. It can mean spiritual beings known as the sons of God, or as they're also called, the Beneha Elohim the sons of God. So it can be those particular beings. It can also mean what is really the entire council of heaven's leadership, heaven's council. There is a thing that we're going to take a look at, and I've mentioned this before, so some of you will be familiar, this idea of a divine council of holy ones. You see this throughout the scriptures, that there are these holy ones that God rules on high with this host of heaven, this divine council. So the meaning of Elohim here, being the sons of God, is not the meaning that is in view here. And you say, well, why? Because we're talking about the beginning of everything that is. So therefore... That view could not be in, in view. Now, there is a view that the divine council is taken into account here. Looking back, that the divine council uh, in God's leadership kind of decided and created. But I, I, and I, I really looked at that, and I think that there's a lot to be said about the divine council. Um, but when I look at this verse and I, and I look at it very specifically about the, the creation of the universe, I think you have to come back to the Elohim is this idea of Yahweh God. Now it is a, a, a plural word. Elohim is a plural word. Any word in Hebrew with I am on the end of it is a plural. And so, and it is used here in a plural. So we can perhaps see the idea of that plurality or the, the three in oneness of the Trinity. Um, and we know that from other scriptures that all the three persons of the Trinity were involved in the creation. And we're going to take a look at that 
We know that from John 1, verse 3 in the New Testament. We know the role of the Spirit, and we'll get to that next week, really, as we take a look at verse 2. But we see this idea of the Godhead, if you want to put it that way. And so I think when we come to this word here, that we look at this idea of Elohim, God. There was a time, and it's not really a time, but it's hard to understand it really when you start trying to really, you can think you can articulate this, but then you start trying to use words about things that are things that are hard to find words to describe. There was a time before time. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? And so really what we're talking about here is the creation of all that there is. We are talking about the the beginning of everything um, that we see here in the first verse of Scripture. And so God existed in eternity past prior to the universe. That's really what we're talking about. Prior to the existence of the universe, God existed. As William Lane Craig would describe this to be a time that God existed sans the universe. Yes, that's a, that's a French word that means without. That God existed without the universe. Okay, So this is really what we're talking about here. Then he created the universe. So you have God existing sans the universe, without the universe, and then you have God creating the universe. He created the universe out of nothing, from nothing, just by the power of his might, the power of his word to create. He created the universe, and within the universe, he created a place for the existence of other divine beings, known in Scripture once again, as the sons of God, and those can be called Elohim. Now, when we come later in the passage, when we see the foundation of the earth laid, we're going to see where there was a time that God existed without the universe. He created the universe, and then there's a time when other spiritual beings are with him, and then other things are created in that process. And we can learn this from the book of Job. Job is actually a book, many people don't know this, but Job actually has a lot to say about the creation of the world. And God, in chapter 38 of Job, he asked Job a lot of questions. In fact, he gave him, a, I believe it's 61 questions, like a major science test. And he, he just failed miserably. In fact, we still fail God's science test today. We still don't know most of the answers to God's questions in Job 38. But this is the question that God asked Job in verse 4. He said this, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, do you have understanding? Who determined the measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? fastened, Or who laid its cornerstone? And then verse 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So what's happening here? I believe back in Genesis 1.1, you have this idea of the moment of creation, the time when God existed without the universe, the universe coming into being, but he also created in this process, the heavens, the space for spiritual beings to exist with him. And then as he laid the foundations of the earth, you have the Beneha Elohim, and he's laying the foundations of the earth and the stars, the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy at the creation, at the laying of the foundation of the earth. Wow, I wish I had that YouTube video, right? I mean, how awesome, how awesome of a moment. Can you imagine Yahweh God creating and laying the foundations of the earth and the morning stars, the B'nai Elohim, shouting for joy. I mean, that must have been a shout. I mean, you want to talk about a shout, and I've heard some shouts. I mean, I've been to the World Series twice. I've been to the Super Bowl. I've been to the NHL Stanley Cup. I mean, I've heard some shouts. But this, this moment, wow. 
An incredible shout. An incredible shout. So what we're really talking about in Genesis 1-1 is the beginning of everything that is. Everything that is, all matter and energy, the universe. It's really the beginning of time and space. And so when you come to take a look at the veracity, go back to Genesis 1-1. When you come back to Genesis 1-1 and you want to talk about the truth of that statement, there are, there are some things that you can look at. There are some, some thought processes that you can go down. You can reason with your mind, use some reasoning, look at it, and you can begin to ask the proper questions that need to be asked about this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I think at this point you have to take a look, perhaps... And I've brought this up before. Godfried Leibniz. He had an argument for the creation from the principle of sufficient reason. I've talked about some of these things as well. The principle of sufficient reason. Leibniz asked this question about the universe. Why is there something rather than nothing? In other words, when you look out, we look out. You know, from our existence here, we look out and we, there's a world, right? We look out. I mean, I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. Here's a beam, you know. Here's lights. Here's stuff, TVs, whatever. Why is there something at all? Why is there anything at all rather than nothing? And this is the question. This is the fundamental question of when you're looking at the principle for sufficient reason, the, the principle of sufficient reason. The basic idea behind the principle is this. Take any feature of the world. If the world could have failed to be that way, then there must be some explanation of why the world is that way. The principle of sufficient reason states that any contingent fact of the world must have an explanation. Any contingent fact of the world must have an explanation. So if something is the way it is, there's a reason that that is the way it is. And so when you bring that concept to the concept of why we have a universe, why is there something rather than nothing at all? This is the question. So we have a universe. Why? How did it get here? What caused it? Or why is there something rather than nothing? And so the sufficient reason in that thought experiment would be the cause. What is the cause? What is the sufficient reason that there's something rather than nothing? And I think that you can flow right from the principle of sufficient reason right into what's called the Kalam cosmological argument. The Kalam cosmological argument for the beginning of the universe. Are you guys still with me? Okay. <laughs> this is fun stuff, man. This is great stuff. I love this stuff, you know? You need to know a little bit about this. Now, I'm not going to go through. I mean, there, I could just spend the next 14 weeks on all this type of stuff. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to give you a little bit of it tonight. Amen. Because I think that you, as a 21st century believer, need to have a little bit of understanding about this, okay? Because there is a wave of disbelief. And we need to be those people ready to give an answer. Amen? So, the, the Kalam. The Kalam cosmological argument. It goes like this. And I'll have it all up here on the screen so you can see it. You can take notes. You can look at it. It basically states this. You have, you have um, in modal logic, you have premises of an argument, and the premises are stated, and what happens, what you need, is the premises of the argument need to be more plausibly true than not. And if the statements, the premises, are more plausibly true than not, then the conclusion naturally follows from the premises. So in order to disprove an argument, you would need to disprove one of the premises. If you can disprove one of the premises, then you can break down the entire argument. But if 
the premises are more plausibly true than not, then the conclusion, conclusion naturally flows, naturally follows, okay? So you have the first premise, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The second premise is this, the universe began to exist. Those are the two premises. So in order to, to falsify this argument, you would need to somehow show that one of these two premises are not true or more plausibly not true than true, okay? If they are true, then the conclusion naturally follows. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, let's just take a minute, and, and we're almost done tonight, okay? So we're, we're, I, I, just want you, I just want you guys to be with me so much. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at faces of joy, face, some faces of bewilderment and puzzle. Okay? Now look at, look at, look at number one. Look at um, the first one. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The reason we believe premise one to be true, or more plausibly true than not, is that something doesn't come from nothing. Something does not come from nothing. And before the universe, there was nothing. Nothing. We see that something brings something into existence. This is what we see. Before the universe existed, there was nothing. And when I say nothing, I want to say it with all capital letters, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Like no thing. <laughs> okay? Like absolutely zero. Nothing. Okay? You say, well, why are you doing that? Because you would be surprised listening to the debates on these particular topics. This is the statement that must be made. Nothing, no thing. Nothing comes from nothing. We don't see things popping into existence from nothing. We don't see that. We see things coming into existence from other causes, other effects. But we don't see anything coming into existence from nothing. Atheists will say, well, the universe doesn't have a cause. And when you say, if the universe could come into being from nothing, and I give credit where credit's due here. This is actually a direct quote from William Lane Craig. Quote, he says, if the universe could come from, into being from nothing, then why is it that only universes can pop into being out of nothing? Why not bicycles and Beethoven and root beer? We don't see those things just popping into existence out of nothing, but somehow a universe can pop into existence out of nothing with no cause. If the universes could pop into being out of nothing, then anything and everything should pop into being out of nothing. Since it doesn't, that suggests that things that come into being have causes. It seems to logically flow. Now this is what the atheist has to believe, though. An atheist believes that the universe popped into existence from nothing. Now, back to when I was kind of going on and on about the, the, the definition of nothing, being like nothing, like no thing whatsoever. Astrophysicist Lawrence Krauss has written a, a book trying to make this very point. Throw that up there on the screen there for us. This is Lawrence Krauss, astrophysicist. And this is his book, A Universe from Nothing. A Universe from Nothing. The only thing is when you read the book and you look at what Krauss calls nothing, it's actually something and not nothing. <laughs> you can't see me. If you're listening to this on podcast, you can't see me. I'm just looking with just, you know, yeah. Something doesn't come from nothing. And when you look at what Lawrence Krauss describes as nothing, it turns out that it's something. Quantum fluctuations and particles, which is, which is something. Now, before atheists believe this, before they... Before they tried to write books like this, <laughs> way, 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 way back, they tried to 
put out a theory called the steady state theory. Remember that? Anybody remember the steady state theory? Come on, from science class. Throw me a bone, somebody. Okay, my parents are here throwing me a bone on the steady state theory. The steady state theory was basically the theory that said that there's been a steady state of the universe and that basically bringing it down to, you know, bare bones, it, it's, you know, the universe has always been here. In other words, the eternity of the universe. So we don't need an explanation for the universe because the universe just has always been here. Well, that really has been blown out of the water even by modern science. No, no one really holds to the steady state theory anymore, even any of the atheists that you could name. Um, you know, Sam Harris, Dawkins, uh, you know, the late great Hitchens, all these guys, they, they, they did not believe in uh, the steady state theory. Because it, it came to be basically shown that, that the universe did have a beginning. It did have a beginning. I've mentioned this before, the philosophical, just a couple pieces of evidence here. The philosophical evidence for the beginning of the universe is the idea of time and that going back in time that you can't have an infinite regression of past time events. If we're in time, the universe has always existed, then how did we get from eternity past to right now? It's impossible. Philosophically, it's impossible because they have divided, they have actually done the science on this, and you can go down about an hour and 45 minute drive from here to Jupiter, Florida, and you can go to the Max Planck Institute, and you can visit where Max Planck was the scientist that actually came up with the smallest measures of time, what's called the Planck second. And so they've divided time down to the lowest possible measure of time, which is called the Planck second. It's 10 to the minus 43 seconds. It's like, it's like a twinkling of an eye. Okay? <clears throat> so you can't have an infinite regression of past time events. So that's just kind of the basic philosophical, uh, quick, quick, very quickly, quick philosophical evidence for the beginning of the universe. But then, of course, then you have the scientific evidence that we see that has come out of modern science, namely most of it coming from, you know, the 20th century. Uh, the universe had a beginning in science. You have something called, this is what they called it, the Big Bang. Now, who's heard of the Big Bang Theory? Not the show, the theory, <laughs> the actual theory, Okay. No one heard the steady state theory, but we've all heard of the big... Yeah, mom and dad, steady state, everybody has heard of the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> this is what science called the moment of the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. It is the beginning of space-time. Alexander Vilenkin, he wrote a book in 2006, it was called Many Worlds in One in which he refers to a theorem that he developed with Alan Guth, Guth and Arvin Bord. It's called the vilenkin bord guth theorem. The vilenkin bord guth theorem. Although not a believer in God, but the multiverse. Okay, so here's what scientists have, have tried to do now. To get away from the scientific evidence that points towards the beginning of the universe, they said, okay, well, really, then we're in like what, what we call a multiverse. So there's, there's millions and billions and trillions of universes, and we just happen to be in this one. Okay, but listen to what Vilenkin says, who was part of the vilenkin bord guth theorem, okay? Although not a believer in God, but the multiverse, Vilenkin says that their theorem proves that even if other universes exist, that there was an absolute beginning of them all. In other words, one cannot posit a multiverse as atheists often do, to avoid an absolute beginning. The Lincoln put it this way, quote, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can now no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. 
You can look it up. Google it. You Google it right now. Yeah. Alexander Vilenkin. Okay? You can't escape from a cosmic beginning, he says. So it seems the consensus from modern science is that the universe had a beginning, just like Genesis 1.1 says. But they want to posit that it somehow came from nothing that is really something. So because the universe began to exist, something caused it to come into existence because something doesn't come from nothing. So, and we're, we're, we're almost done. Are you, are you still with me? Yes. Okay. This, I, this is important stuff. You, you guys need to hear this. Anybody having fun? Okay. Praise the Lord. So if you look at the first two premises, go back to the cosmological argument. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. That seems to be true. The universe began to exist. We looked at that. That seems to be true. Therefore, the universe has a cause. The universe has a cause. Now, what is the cause? What is the cause? You can infer a lot about the cause from the effect. Write that down. You can infer a lot about the cause from the effect. The effect is the universe. You look at the universe, you could tell a little bit about the cause from the effect. Therefore, the cause, if the effect is the universe, the cause of the universe must be something beyond the universe. It can't be in the universe. It can't be made of the same stuff as the universe because then that would be more universe. Okay, you following me? So, the, so you can tell a little bit about the cause by looking at the effect. The effect is the universe. The cause must be something beyond the effect, beyond, in this case, the universe. So it also means that the cause of the universe must be at least these things. Spaceless. Because it created space. Timeless, because it created time. Immaterial, because it created matter. Powerful, because it created out of nothing. Intelligent, because the creation event and the universe was precisely designed. We don't have time to get into the tele teleological argument tonight. I would really lose you there. <laughs> Personal. Because it made a choice to convert a state of nothing into something. Impersonal forces don't make choices. Now listen to this. A cause that is spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, intelligent, and personal is exactly what we call God. Amen? The God of the Bible. I need to say that again. A cause that is spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, intelligent, and personal is exactly what we call God, the God of the Bible. In this argument, the cause of the universe is the creator God that we see in Genesis 1.1. So you say, Charles, okay, I've listened to it all. I've heard you. You know, Vilenkin board goo theorems and JDEP theories and all kinds of stuff, the Yahwist and whatever, okay? You say, so what? Why should I believe in God? There are many answers to that question, and I'm only going to present one here tonight. Because belief in God is the foundation for a meaningful life, a life of meaning. Amen. Belief in God is the foundation for a life of meaning, believing in God. Some of the atheists of the 19th century are what are called nihilists, nihilists, okay? And they basically espoused a, a various form of what we call nihilism. <clears throat> and it's basically... To, you know, to bring it all the way down to like, you know, so we can all understand, nothingism. <laughs> this is nothingism, okay? It's an ism of nothing. And this is where I believe 
atheists of the 19th century that I think were being intellectually honest with the conclusions that they were making from their philosoph philosophizing, they came to the conclusion that if there is no God, then nothing matters. Nothing matters. If there is no God, then nothing has any ultimate value or meaning. And that's why belief in God is the foundation for a life of meaning. Amen? You say, well, my life has meaning. I've heard the atheists. I've talked to them on Twitter myself. Hundreds of them on one particular night when I simply having to be tweeting something along the effects of what I'm talking about right now. Nihilism. And I was barraged with atheists from around the world. I don't know how it happened. It's just this thing called Twitter. <laughs> People would say, well, that's so, di that's so disappointing that you have that view. No, no, no. This is the conclusion of your position, not mine. My life has meaning. Your position concludes with nothing has meaning. Nothing is of any value. You say, well, my life has meaning. My life has purpose. But that is because you're the creation of a loving God. That's because there's a God in heaven that exists. If this world is an accident and it blows up right now, what is lost? If this whole universe went away like that and there's no God, tell me what has been lost? Nothing. The world, the universe has purpose and meaning because it was brought into existence by a loving God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'll close with this. When King Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, he starts out by talking about the fact that he did not deny himself anything. And he did not deny himself anything that he wanted. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. Just sit down and read it. It's a wild book. It's an interesting book. Solomon had everything that he wanted. I mean, he was like, you know, the term ivory tower was because his throne was built on these large stairs made out of ivory. And people would come from all over the world and sit and listen to him, King Solomon, sitting on his ivory tower, just give all of this important information and knowledge and wisdom. He doesn't deny himself anything. And he comes down to the conclusion of the entire thing, the entire book. Part of the conclusion was, man, everything's meaningless. This just keeps on going and going and going and nothing seems to really matter. But then he comes to the right conclusion. You pick it up in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. You'll see it on the screen. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or good. Or evil. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, but I just want to unpack this one thing in conclusion. Everything does matter. Yeah. Everything does matter. And most importantly, your life matters because you're the creation of a loving God who brought you into being, who loves you, who formed you, the Bible says, in your mother's womb. And he loves you. And because he's the creator of this world and creator of everything, he created you and he loves you so much. And because of all those things, your life matters. And it matters whether you love God in return. It matters. Because belief in God and knowing him is the foundation of a meaningful life, of a life that matters. Amen? Amen. So here in Genesis 1-1, we found the foundation of everything. 
we found the foundation for meaning and the foundation for faith. Amen?